Greetings there, everyone, and welcome back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you start to love what you are hearing, please join the family by hitting that subscribe button and then setting your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time a video is uploaded. If you're curious about becoming a member, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a better person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I have no evidence, and I do not care if you don't believe me. I've used a board with results and let something into my home, and have been physically assaulted by this entity. It started out with that feeling like you're being watched, and doors closing, and footsteps on a hardwood when you were home alone, and progressed slowly into being kept awake by something shaking the bed or pulling off your covers, sometimes even whispering your name. The board would disappear for days on end, then show up in places you never would have put it. I became obsessed with it. Then it was a black mass in the corner of my room, or the silhouette of a man watching you from the doorway. After that, it escalated pretty quickly. I had my hair pulled, fingers pricked, scratched, choked, held down in bed while this thing whispered in my ear what could have only been Latin. We had our house blessed and the bad thing hasn't shown back up. Just the normal occurrences now, but I will never again play with one of those Ouija boards. When I was about 14, my best friend had a sleepover birthday party. Being the silly little girls we were, we decided to make a Ouija board to use, not really knowing any of the rules like making it say goodbye. After an hour or so, I wandered off to read some tarot cards and watch the rest of the exorcist with the other couple of girls who didn't want to commune with spirits. Rereading that last sentence, I sound like such a stereotype. I still use tarot cards, though, so I never grew out of this phase, it seems. Here's where it got weird. After I left the spirit talking to my friends, everything changed. As in, it switched to a different spirit altogether. His name was Max, and he was looking for me. I've never known a Max in my entire life. My friends yelled out what he was saying as it moved and I was writing off as them teasing me until he started giving them information about me that no one at that party knew. Things about minor abuse I was facing and other little things. That freaked me right out. I begged for them to stop playing even after Max tried to convince me that he was not trying to hurt me. My friends were awesome and stopped playing before I started crying, and I thought that was the end of it. The next time a Ouija board came out was the next year, and only one girl from the original party was amongst the group. We were baking a cake, so when the buzzer went off, she and I head up to take it out of the oven. When we got back to the group, another girl turned to me and asked, Who's Max? Apparently, he's stuck around after the first time. If my friends want to use a Ouija board, they don't invite me over unless they want to speak to Max. He's always around. A few times in my life, I've heard a voice call out my name. It usually makes me stop for a minute. No more, but at least twice. Had I not stopped, I would have been in the path of a car going too fast to stop before it would have hit me. 
I strongly believe Max has stuck around to be helpful, but had we not pulled out that Ouija board, I would not have never known about him. This past summer, me and my friend were on a spooky kick. You know, scary movies, sleepover games, midnight rituals, just a bunch of stuff to really freak us out. The ending of this kick was, of course, to play with the Ouija board. We bought it, then went over to her friend's house because she was house-setting and it was empty. We arrived, looked up rules, lit candles, and followed everything the internet said to do. At first, we weren't getting anything. We were both wishful thinking, I think, and were subconsciously moving it at first. It was going really slow and not making any sense. So, we looked up what to do if nothing was working, and it said to take a break and come back to it. So, that's what we did. When we came back, as soon as we did, the board started answering our questions. I am a former self-harmer and have a suicidal past and things like that. The first thing that alarmed me was that it said there were 13 entities in the room with us. I asked why and it said, you bleed, which I instantly just knew they were talking about the self-harm, which was terrifying. So we stopped, said goodbye and everything and took another break. We came back and I asked it if there was something that I should know. It proceeded to tell me a very huge secret that my friend was keeping from me. She tried to stop and when she did it gave me even more details about what had happened. We stopped then because neither of us could handle it anymore. We threw the board away in a McDonald's dumpster and tried not to think of it. About two weeks later the board was back and in my friend's mom's back seat. No idea how it got there. My friend knew nothing of how it got there, and her mom didn't even know we did it because we would, of course, get into huge trouble. After playing with the board for about two weeks after, I constantly felt watched and this deep, heavy feeling walking around in my house. I heard noises constantly. One time, my phone glitched and distorted, the voice on the other end, and then shut off. A bang went off by my face one night that sounded like someone punching the wall as hard as they could, and hearing noises in the cupboard, and opening it to find cups and bowls flipped over completely or on their sides. All of this went away, though, and I rarely feel things, although... Sometimes that heavy feeling comes back, and I truly regret ever touching that Ouija board. I collect Ouija boards. I know how strange that sounds. Most people will collect stamps, coins, vinyl posters, and the like. I should probably preface this by saying I have pretty extensive knowledge of the paranormal. I have been having experiences with it since I was a child. This led me to delve into the world of paranormal investigation in my teens and early 20s, which coincided with my being to collect the boards. Since then, I have amassed quite a collection, but there is one that I refuse to even keep in my house. I call it the Salem board. I used to do special effects makeup for films and I was in Salem, Massachusetts for a job. As you have probably gathered, I'm a lover of the strange, unusual, and all things creepy, so I was thrilled by this opportunity. I had gotten into town a few days before filming began so I could prep, but also, so I could do a little sightseeing. I was wandering through some of the shops and happened to walk into one that had a pretty large collection of Ouija boards. Some were vintage, some were etched glass, and some were burnt wood. 
At the back of the shop, there was a locked display, which immediately caught my eye. Alone on the top shelf was a board that looked as though it was the cross section of a tree stump. It had the usual markings of a Ouija board, but they looked to be hand carved into the wood. It was also covered with runes. I went to the guy behind the counter and asked him how much it was. It's not for sale, he said quietly. Uh, why not? I asked. He looked back at the cabinet and then back at me. That board is made from a tree that was used to hang witches during the Salem witch trials. I looked at him skeptically. That was a pretty tall claim. I really did want that board, though. It would look really great in my collection and be a cool conversation piece. Are you sure you don't want to sell it? Once again, he looked between me and the cabinet. $150. Cash. No returns. I handed him the money and he walked to the cabinet to unlock it. He must have noticed the confused look on my face when he handed me the board. It doesn't come with the planchette. This board was not exactly meant to be used. I wasn't exactly sure how to respond to that, so I just said thanks and left the shop. Fast forward a few months. I am back home in Seattle in my one-bedroom apartment where I lived alone. I had put the Salem board in a box in my closet since I was waiting on a new display case and didn't really have anywhere else to put it. My closet had two sliding doors and a shelf on top of the bar where you would hang clothes. The shelf was actually pretty large, so it accommodated the box with room to spare. I had gone to bed that night and fell asleep with the TV on. I was awoken at around 3 a.m. by the sound of something hitting my closet door. I checked to make sure my ball python, Kronos, was in his cage since every time he got out, he would try and get into my closet where the hot water heater was. I saw he was curled up under his log and cautiously opened the closet door to see the box had fallen off the shelf and was now resting against the door. I was puzzled at this but thought in my sleepiness that I had just not pushed it back far enough. I pushed the box back and went back to sleep. About 30 minutes later, I heard another noise from my closet, but this time it was much louder. When I opened my eyes, I could see that one of my closet doors had been pushed outwards. The box had fallen off the shelf again, but this time had done it with so much force it had wedged between my clothes and the door. At this point, I was becoming a bit concerned. Instead of putting the box back on the shelf, I placed it on the floor of my closet and shut the door. When I woke up in the morning, I turned over to grab my phone off the nightstand and saw my closet door wide open. The box had been pushed out into the middle of my room. At this point, I became concerned. This was an object with a lot of emotion attached to it. A lot of anger and a lot of pain and suffering. I thought it'd be best to keep it in a box and put the box in my storage unit. A few years go by, and my mom keeps bugging me to clean out some things from the unit since she needed some space for her stuff. It was in the middle of summer, and the storage unit was sweltering. I was going through boxes, aimlessly tossing things into piles, when I came across the box. The room was suddenly freezing. I took the lid off and looked down. The Salem board was sitting on top of several other Ouija boards I had acquired over the years. They had all been cracked in half down the middle, all of them except the Salem board. I stared into the box, trying to comprehend what I was looking at. These boards looked like someone had broken them over their knee. Surely not the result of a box being dropped or jostled. I removed the board from the box and placed it into a wooden chest. I had acquired that chest for my great-grandmother, who had considered herself to be a witch. It remains in that box to this day. 
I believe there are forces in this world that we will never understand. I am sure you are wondering why I didn't get rid of the board. In a way, I feel tied to it. It called to me and I answered. I consider myself its keeper. As long as it is with me, everyone else is safe from whoever or whatever is attached to it. I've never dabbled in anything besides homemade tarot cards, but my aunt did. She was known for always being very reckless and carefree. When she was about 15, she was left home alone and decided that she wanted to try a Ouija board. Whenever she's been asked why, she just tells us that she's been curious and wanted to know if they really work. She had to wait to be alone because my grandfather didn't allow for my aunt to dabble in practices that could go dark with good reason. However, when they left her home alone, she decided to try it. They didn't have a Ouija board since my grandmother would never allow it, so instead she crafted one out of wood and a sharpie. I know most of you are thinking that there's no way that would work, but... There have been many cases where it has. If you provide spiritual or demonic entities with a medium you contact with, it doesn't matter what it is. By touching the makeshift wooden planchette with the intent of summoning something, my aunt granted whatever entity access to communicate with her and potentially attach itself to her. Unfortunately, that is what happened. The Ouija board ended up working, much to my aunt's initial delight, and she got in contact with the spirits of an old woman. The woman told her that she could predict the future, so of course my aunt asked her questions such as, what will I study in university, or where will I be in 20 years, and how will I die? My aunt was skeptic of this woman's abilities, but knew that she shouldn't ask about her death date. Even if the woman couldn't, the date would still be in my aunt's mind and most likely plague her thought. Anyways, the board answered, English, Canada, and the same as your mother eventually will, breast cancer. My aunt at the same time thought all of these things were ludicrous since she has always wanted to study the sciences in university, was from India and intended to stay there, and at the time, my grandma hadn't gotten cancer yet. So my aunt being the ballsy and stupid kid she was, taunted the entity about her disbelief and asked the entity to prove it. So the entity told her that my grandfather would be home in one hour, earlier than planned, and catch her with the board. She didn't believe the entity, of course, and continued to taunt it. This, in turn, angered it and resulted in becoming hostile towards my aunt. My aunt started experiencing cuts forming on her arm, and they continued to travel up. She screamed and threw the planchette, right when my grandfather walked in and caught her in the act, saying he was fuming, was apparently an understatement. My grandfather, being very spiritual, closed the board properly by saying goodbye and immediately had a priest come bless the house. Afterwards, my aunt, of course, was in a lot of trouble. She tried to show my uncle the cuts received on her arms, only for them to have disappeared. The pain was still there, without any of the physical scarring. It's safe to say my aunt was petrified. The worst part? My aunt went to university to study English. After getting her bachelor's, the whole family immigrated to Canada as my grandfather's visa finally got approved. He was planning this for ages, but the visa took over a decade to be approved. Finally, my grandma has gotten breast cancer twice, and while she hasn't passed away yet, her time is approaching. My aunt is obviously petrified and tells all of us this story to ensure we never dabble in any of these spiritual objects. 
I myself am quite the skeptic of all things spiritual and demonic in nature. I am an atheist, ex-theist, and wonder if there is any plausibility to this because I can't deny that my aunt is always petrified at the mention of any of these objects. She is not the type to be frightened easily or anything of the such, so it does make me question whether or not this is real. Have any of you had similar experiences with an entity that could predict the future or cause cuts on your arm that vanished? Or simply, any sort of story revolving around contacting spirits that you think may help me understand all of this and more, and maybe lower my skepticism? If so, please let me know. When I was younger, I used to be obsessed with ghosts and all sorts of haunting shows. Now, I'd never particularly have a reason to believe my house was haunted. But one day my brother came home claiming to have found $10 out of nowhere. I'll never know for sure if he was just messing with me, but after curiosity got the best of me, I asked him where he really got the $10 from. Stupid me assumed maybe a friend. Perhaps he stole it from my parents' wallet. My parents never claimed to have been missing any money, however. Something they would definitely have voiced distraught about if they'd noticed we'd taken their cash. The story he gave me was that a young girl about the age of seven had followed him onto the school bus that afternoon. He'd never met this girl and had never seen her around school grounds. But she decided to sit in the seat in front of him. After riding the bus for a little while, she started to talk to him. Nobody else could see her according to him and other kids were giving him looks. Eventually, she handed him $10 with a note and then subsequently got off the bus at the next stop. I immediately assumed he was lying and laughed, of course. I asked him to show me the note, which he promptly pulled out from his room and passed me a tiny piece of paper. A shiver ran down my spine as the note wasn't in his handwriting, but in the handwriting of what I could only assure to be a young child that read, I'll help you, but only this time which I believe was in response to the fact that my brother was begging my parents for a Zelda charm bracelet for months, which they refused to buy him. Given that he had $10 now, he could just buy it himself, though. Of course, me being me was extremely intrigued by this, even if it seemed absurd. I suggested we make a makeshift Ouija board and see if we can contact anyone. So, we wrote the alphabet on a piece of paper and grabbed a necklace to hover above the DIY board. My brother was interested too, so he decided it could be fun. Mind you, I was in 6th grade and he was in 4th grade at the time, so any sort of movement from the necklace caught our attention and we immediately thought it was a ghost. After asking a few questions, the necklace began to move and shake. Either my brother was really good at tricking me by slowly sliding the necklace across the board, or it really was something paranormal. We were able to get a name, Kate. After asking dumb things like, did you watch me complete the Shadow Temple in Ocarina of Time? And getting a yes, me and my brother decided to stop for the night after being creeped out. We never said goodbye before ending, however. Eventually, playing with the board would be a daily occurrence at this point. We thought we'd made a friend and truly believed that someone was talking to us. Me and my brother decided to take things a step further and try to record something. So, we got both our tablets, placed them in front of our TV, and hit record. The first thing I asked was, if someone's here, move something in the room. Nothing. 
Okay. Well, maybe the ghost is shy. We decided to ask the same question, but this time we said we'll leave the room to give it time. We went downstairs for something like five minutes, and when we got back upstairs, our tablets had both fallen to the floor and stopped recording. Maybe a coincidence. I mean, things fall, especially when you're not careful at placing them, so we brushed it off. In December of sixth grade, though, things got weird. I'd started hearing a voice in my head claiming that they were the ghost I was talking to while playing the Ouija board. I'd gotten so scared one night, I grabbed the Bible one of my religious friends had gifted me, I'm not religious by the way, and would sleep with it. Eventually, I told my mom that there was a ghost telling me scary things. I won't get into detail as some of it was a little graphic. She and my dad argued for a while about whether or not I was schizophrenic and if I should see a therapist. So, out of fear, I never told them I was hearing voices again. But I spaced out, often, talking and having conversations with this thing I believed to be a ghost. Eventually, I forgot about the ghost and we no longer talked. I will never know what that voice was if I was genuinely insane, if they were just intrusive thoughts. I was just glad for it to have stopped. Nothing necessarily paranormal has happened to me since, besides my TV turning on randomly in the middle of the night, or the feeling of someone pushing my legs with some sort of unknown force every once in a while. I sum it up to be just my imagination playing tricks on me now. But I do still have this looming feeling that ever since I played with that Ouija board, I have some sort of spirit attached to me, following me. Not a bad one, but just a looming presence. This is a long story. And I don't care what you think, but it is 100% true. In the summer of 2019, I was 19 at the time, I had a lot of shit happen that caused me to become very depressed. My boyfriend had just broken up with me without telling me why, and shortly after, I was assaulted by my so-called friend. Needless to say, I was at a point in my life where I didn't give a shit about anything, so, when my friend asked if I wanted to use a Ouija board with her, of course I said, hell yeah. We agreed to go to our local Books A Million to buy the board and decided we would split the cost since it was only $20. My friend, we'll call her Lily, instantly started having doubts about whether we should mess with that kind of stuff. Both of us are Christians and were always taught that messing with that stuff was a big no-no. However, I assured her that all would be well and that if it would make her more comfortable, we could buy some protection incense to burn around the house while we played. That made her feel better and we proceeded to purchase the board. The main reason Lily wanted to use the board was because her grandmother had just passed away and she wanted to see if she could contact her. I did warn her that if her grandmother was in heaven, she most likely wouldn't come through since the Lord wouldn't allow that. I did support her and agreed to at least try to contact her. As for my motive, since I was little, I had always felt something or someone wanted to talk to me. So, being the depressed girl I was, I was just like, fuck it, bring it on, demons. I also had vivid dreams where, in every one of them, I was assaulted by demons and would end up being the mother of the Antichrist. I obviously didn't and still don't take these dreams seriously, but my friend was intrigued to see if anything or anyone would care to explain them to me. Fast forward to her grandmother's house. 
Lily's grandfather wasn't there because he was taking physical therapy for his hip. So, it was just us and the board. I could tell Lily was nervous, and a small part of myself was too, but I refused to show it. I was assigned to be the guide person that asks questions and such, so I placed myself in a comfortable position and opened the board. Are there any spirits that would like to speak with us today? Nothing. The planchette didn't move and everything was silent. I asked the same question about four or five times before there was movement. As soon as it moved to yes, I asked what their name was. It spelled out some sort of gibberish that I can't remember and ended up telling us. It was one of my cousins that died in a fire. I knew that I didn't have any known cousins that had died in a fire, but I played along with it. At some point, the spirit started making a figure eight across the board and counting down numbers, for which I said a stern, hell no, before saying goodbye and moving to the next session. This time, little girl kept contacting us repeatedly, except she didn't make figure eights or count down like she had before. Lily and I both tried to figure out what the hell this thing wanted. Before we knew it, this little girl changed into a male demon named Bovo. Based upon my readings about Ouija boards, I knew that this could have been Zozo. However, he swore up and down that he wasn't, but Zozo was in the room with us. Apparently, Zozo wanted to harm us, but Bobo wanted to protect us. Not Lily. Just me. Which I thought was weird as fuck. After talking with him some more, we learned that he was present in all those dreams that I had been having. He was destined to be the father of said Antichrist, claimed that he was, and is deeply in love with me. Of course, I thought all of this was bullshit, but Lily was excited and began asking questions. Every time she would ask something, the planchette moved to no. Eventually, she gave up and asked if he just wanted to talk with me. I agreed and continued asking questions. Apparently, there was this whole plan in hell I was going to be the mother of the Antichrist. Bobo was in very high ranks when it came to other demons. According to him, his rank was right below Lucifer's. All of a sudden, the planchette flew to goodbye, and the board stopped all movement. Lily and I agreed to try one more time to contact her grandmother. But, of course, it was Bobo again. He said he had revealed too much information and displeased Lucifer. But at the same time, Lucifer, or Satan, wanted me to know some of this knowledge. I'm still completely skeptical at this point, so I just shrugged and said, eh, whatever. All of a sudden, I could feel something brushing against my lips and cheeks. The feeling moved down to my breasts and caused me to shiver. I yelled out, fuck this, and closed the session. Then... Both of us lit lavender incense and walked all around the house, saying the Lord's Prayer. After that, it was getting late, so we went inside and went to bed. I don't know what made me want to use the board by myself, but the next day, I thought it would be a good idea to do so. Lily sat in front of me while I did it alone and watched as the planchette moved to spell out the name Bovo. After talking for a solid two minutes, I got creeped out and stopped. Fast forward months later, I was at my friend Kate's house with my other friend Ashley. My father had burned the board once he knew I used it, but we all wanted to use it again, so we went to good old books a million again and purchased another board. Lo and behold, after we started using it, Bovo was the only one to come through. He yelled at both of my friends and told them he only wanted me to talk. He claimed he had been watching me since I was five, and that everything that was planned was supposed to go down in 2023. 
He also said that in order to get me pregnant, he was going to either, warning here, R word that I can't say here on YouTube, or possess my current boyfriend and do it that way. Nevertheless, this all creeped the hell out of my friends and we stopped using it. You would think I would learn by this point, but a couple of months later, I am now 20, I went to my other friend Amanda's house and got high with her and her friends. This was probably the stupidest thing I've done in my life, but Jay encouraged all of us to play while we were high. I don't remember any of it, if I'm being honest here, but according to Amanda, I was saying random shit and they had contacted Vovo. Vovo refuses to let anyone talk and kept spelling my name. However, I was too gone to say or do anything. After an hour of my friends trying to get him to talk to them, he spelled my name the entire time. They gave up and helped me get to bed. Moral of the story, it seems that whenever I use the Ouija board, I talk to the same spirit or demon. You may wonder if I'm worried about this, to which I tell you, not at all. I'm still very strong in my faith, and believe the Lord wouldn't allow that to happen. I guess we'll just have to wait and see in 2023. This is a story from my life that I've told to people, especially teenagers, to warn them to never use the Ouija board. It's long, but I hope it serves that purpose. When I was a senior in high school in 1989, my brother came home from college on spring break and told stories about him and some friends using the Ouija board. It had done some things to freak them out. So, we dug out the one we had in our attic. I don't know why we had it or where we got it from. He showed me what they had done, but nothing happened with us. I brought it to a friend's house, and we tried it out a few times over the course of a few evenings. And then, about the third or fourth time, it really started to pick up in its responses. We had been starting by knocking three times in the corner of the board and saying something like, Come, spirit, or something to that effect. Anyway, the marker started to really move around the board and spell things out. I always tell people that it was either our subconsciousness or a spirit moving it around because I was certain neither of us was moving it intentionally. With a light touch of a few fingers from each of our hands, it would just move to spell things like its own personality. We would ask it all the usual questions, test questions and curiosity ones. One day, though, I wasn't a fan of it. My friend asked the board in which years we would each die. It spelled out something like 2040 or 40-ish for my friend. I actually don't remember the number, just that it was far in the future at the time. And 1990 for me, which was the next year. I ask, does that mean I'm going to die in 1990 and my friend in 20 something? No, it said. Then I ask again, this time switching the years around between us. Yes, it said. We asked the spirit about itself. It said it died the year my friend's father was born and said its name was Stephen Crane. We kind of laughed at that part. Of course, I looked up dates about the author after that, but things didn't seem to jibe. I thought, could be another person with that name and moved on. Anyway, we started to invite friends over to watch who were all entirely skeptical. By the end of the evening, every single one was freaked out. More and more friends would come each night until we started getting a huge group of people. The board would answer plenty of the test questions wrong. But then, for example, 
while everyone's reacting to the wrong answer and half paying attention. It's spelling out sorry and another time, for example, and a lull between activity while people are distracted and chatting. It moves slowly to S, then kept circling around to H, 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 H until it came to a stop there. Nothing for about two minutes. The entire room of people completely silent. Then it slowly moved to OK. It said a bad spirit had passed through the room. Everyone freaks out, and it didn't like this one friend, and every time he even entered the room when we had these gatherings, the marker would twist and move to the opposite side of the board, and other things like that happened. Again, it had its own personality. I remember a few times driving home alone, with that thing in the back seat of the car terrified with my heart pounding. One time, I asked it, where will I go to college? It spelled out one of the schools I was applying to, and then 37. I asked it if I was going to go to that school and get a 3.7 GPA the first semester, and it said yes. I was sure all along that my friend wasn't moving it intentionally, but I had proof because one day, he was really disturbed and frustrated with his girlfriend a friend of mine. He had suspected she was cheating on him, and he asked the board a question about her while using it with a friend, and it told him to turn on the TV. What You Don't Know Might Hurt You by Exposed was playing on TV. I remember he really took that to heart, and it affected his trust in their relationship. So, I always knew he wasn't just playing around with the board, and that was a sort of hard proof of it. We started to actually use the board with our friends, but it only worked when one of us two used it with someone. We asked the spirit why that was, and it responded that the spirit was inside my friend, and that I was the owner of the board. Some freaky shit thinking back on it now, but as an 18-year-old, you think differently. Anyway, the enthusiasm started to peter out after a few months, maybe near the end of the summer, and I don't know what happened to the Ouija board. I did end up going to that college that the board mentioned, but it didn't really catch my attention. When I got home for my first semester after 1990 had just begun, I got my grades. I got a 3.7. I don't remember if I made the connection or not, but I certainly did when the next thing happened. Around the same week or so, maybe even around the same day, I got the annual catalog that my college sent us with articles and updates and whatnot. I opened it up, and there in front of me was a whole article about Stephen Crane. He had gone to my college for a while, and I never had any idea of it. I remember having instant chills. Ten years later, I was buying a condo and a lot of serendipitous things. Good things were happening around the purchase. That event with the Ouija board was so salient with me that I decided to do a good search to find out if Stephen Crane had lived in the condo I was buying. I didn't find anything and the condo was great, but if I had found something, I would definitely have put it out of the P&S. Finally, the sad part is that later in 1990, after returning to college classes after Thanksgiving break, my friend, one of my best friends, died suddenly and unexpectedly from a heart problem. I don't know when I made the connection with the board, because by then it was over a year later. But at some point, I did. And then, I started to put the whole storyline together. It sank in more how creepy and dark the whole thing is. I am happy in life, very blessed. I did go through a form of spiritual growth some years ago where the darkness was left behind. And this story of my past doesn't haunt me. 
I share it in the hopes it's helpful for others. But I would never touch a Ouija board again and would strongly advise against anyone using one. To this day, I am still positive that it was not our conscious action at work, but either our subconscious or truly a spirit. So whichever of those you might believe it is, nothing good comes from playing around with either of them. At the minimum, negligence can open up a path for psychological and emotional problems. And at worst, relating with a spirit can let in a darkness and fear beyond your understanding or strength that can tint your life and affect you for years to come. A quick edit. After reflecting back on this story, I wanted to add more context for the reason for posting and choice of title. I mentioned a few times that I thought the source of the board's movement was either subconsciousness or spiritual paranormal. As a person of religious faith with a science and engineering background, I still do think that it was one or the other, or a mixture of both. I have a great respect for both the human sciences and human spiritual wisdom, and both of these have always had guidance in the form of professional individuals and or community experience. For a reason, psychology and spirituality can be very deep and heavy, so they can be quite dangerous and harmful if practiced without experience guidance. The problem with the Ouija board is that it is mass-produced and marketed as an innocent game for kids aged 8 plus, which is not only an insult to both science professionals and human wisdom traditions, but also creates the dangerous situations of people playing with their psyche when they are not equipped to process the consequences. Under the branding of innocent game, Ouija boards make it into the homes and hands of unprepared, unguided people, causing psychological and spiritual damage. I think it's reckless and negligent on the part of the manufacturers, so I don't so much blame the Ouija board as I do them. So, I hope my story presents one example in all of that context, and that is why I say, don't ever use it. I had a birthday party when I was 12, and one of the gifts I got from a friend was a Ouija board. I went to Catholic school, and all the girls at my bowling birthday party, yeah, I thought I was so cool, were from my class, so this was a very risky gift for that crowd, now that I actually think about it. My mom tried to hide her displeasure at the time when I was opening it, but as soon as we walked out of the bowling alley, she took the board and threw it in the dumpster. I was annoyed that she did that, and she explained that the Ouija board is a tool of the devil, and it would not be entering into our home. I thought she was being ridiculous at the time, and soon after, I would realize, like many other times in my life, that she was right. I often would go to my friend's house, the one who gave me the board, after school. She lived close by to me, and my mom and dad worked late. I had told her about the board being thrown into the dumpster, so she suggested that we ride our bikes and see if it was still there. It was, and we took it back to her house and started playing with it. At first, I thought it was so stupid. We obviously were moving the planchette around. We would ask stupid questions like, Does so-and-so like me? Which new kid on the block will I marry? Yeah, shut up, I'm that old. And so on. Well, this would be a every afternoon occurrence, and we got a lot of laughs out of it. Then, one afternoon, we asked if anyone wanted to contact us. We never really asked that before. Well, some girl named Lily, not her real name, came through. We asked her how old she was, 
She said she was nine and where she lived, she said she lived next to this house. She also said she was born in 1950, which was the same year that my mom and my friend's mom was born. Neither one of us thought at the time that this was real, but every time we would use the board, she would come through though. We asked how she died and she said she drowned in her backyard. So, now we know this was completely made up. We know both houses on either side of my friend's house has no pool or lake or any body of water in its backyard. So, after that, we kind of got bored with Lily or the Lily story we were making up as we thought at the time and started asking stupid questions that we did before about the boys liked us, etc., Lily didn't like that, and the next word on the board was don't, then ignore, then me. Just then, there was a loud banging like someone knocking on the wall next to us. It freaked us out. We packed up the board and put it away. The next day, my friend didn't show up at school. When my friend came back to school, she passed me this note about how we had to meet at recess about Lily. At recess, my friend told me that unexplained things started happening at her house. One of her stuffed animals, a bear she had since she could remember, kept turning up in different places in her house. She swore that she just didn't put it there and forget. She decided to put the bear on top of the china closet, which involved her standing on a chair to do so. She said she did this so that there would be no mistaking where the bear was left. Her cat started acting weird and kept hissing at something no one could see. The cat would hiss and slowly back away as if whatever it was was walking towards it. Well, when it was time to go to bed that night, she walked into her room, and lo and behold, the bear was on her bed. She ran into her mom's room, scared, and said the house was haunted, and told her about the bear. Her mom reassured her that the house was not haunted. She had lived in this house her entire life, so she would know. Apparently, the mom grew up in the house, and when my friend's dad died shortly after, my friend was born. She moved in with her parents, who then moved into a retirement community, leaving the house to her. She also explained that this bear couldn't be scary because the bear was hers when she was a kid and she had it forever. The mother went on to say that the bear was very special because it was given to her by a dear friend. My friend asked who this friend was since she never heard her talk about the bear and how this friend gave it to her. She said that her best friend growing up lived next door. They were very close and played together every day. The bear was given to her by the girl for her birthday when she turned nine. She kept the bear and gave it to her daughter to remember her friend since she died shortly afterwards. The friend's name was Lily and she died by drowning. Apparently there was a pool next door, but after Lily drowned in it, it was filled in. She said she felt very regretful because Lily and her had had a fight and she didn't want to play with her anymore. She said that Lily came to the door right before she passed and started banging on it, but my friend's mom didn't answer. Lily told her to come play with her in the pool. My friend's mom still didn't answer, and her last words before she left was, Don't ignore me. She said she always felt guilty because if she had gone with her, she wouldn't have drowned because she would have been there to help her. After telling her mom what had happened, they decided the best thing to do was to get rid of the board. The strange activity still happened, though. We told our teacher, who was a nun, about the entire thing. She said she doubt it was actually Lily, but a demon pretending to be Lily to gain access to the home. She recommended having a priest come by to bless the house. They did, and unfortunately the activity got worse. It became unbearable to live there anymore, and my friend and her mom ended up moving in with their grandparents, who lived in another state. 
I sometimes pass the house today when I'm visiting my parents and wondered if Lily is still there. So, that's my story. Take it for what it's worth. But I agree with all the skeptical people. Stay away from Ouija boards. Even if you think it's fake, why take the chance? And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija board stories. Before I go any further, I would like to take this opportunity and acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita B., Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S., Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Thank you all once again for remaining to be the pillars that Back to Ashes stands on. I cannot express my gratitude and love for you all enough. Thank you. For the other subscribers and for the first time listeners or others that just pop by to check out Back to Ashes, thank you for your support. For without you, I wouldn't have a voice and there would not be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.